sum it up for me, Richard. What what does what today meant for you? I thought it was an incredibly cynical exercise on the part of the ministers, the government. It struck me as all circus, all performance, all pantomime, no sincerity, no integrity whatsoever. Mm. Um, they had these huge marquees. Um, there was food, there was dancing, there was singing, there were masters of ceremonies and red carpets. You know, no, no sense at all of what the real issues were. Um, the Minister of um, Police characterised it as those in favour of development and those who were opposed. The DMR guy characterises a conflict between those who support mining and development versus those who support the environment. Um, it was also characterised at times as a conflict between insiders and outsiders, meaning uh, Australians and white people and uh, lawyers and uh, people like yourself. And none of these um, cari caricatures um, ac accurately describe what the real conflict and the real tension is about, which is about people's fear for their their, their, their way of life, for their homes, for their land, for their culture, for their traditions, for everything that they are, uh, mining threatens that. And there is no understanding, seemingly no understanding and no appreciation that this is the underlying issue and this is the fundamental cause for, for, for this conflict. There was absolutely no um, self-reflection, there was absolutely no well, have the police done their job properly? Have they done it adequately? There was a complete denial that there's any problem with the police. So at one stage, um, the minister was saying to people, well, if you've got a grievance, we've got a desk outside, come here, lay your complaint. As if we haven't done that, as if we haven't prepared reams of papers and affidavits and depositions and um, done everything possible to assist the police to perform their jobs. No recognition whatsoever. Mm. Absolutely nothing. You know, while they dominate the stage and they control the proceedings, everything's orchestrated. But the moment we went into the question sessions, and the first question given to a, a strong pro mining guy, the a director of Zolka, who stood up there and then started saying emphatically how the people demanded mining and they wanted mining and that they needed mining and you know, so obviously managed, so manipulated, so dishonest, so brute, it created uproar. I mean, um, it was up to Nontle to, uh, to, to bring things under control. It was up to her to... She was the only one with the authority and the status there to, uh, to try and bring things down. Um, the Minister of um, Police didn't like that at all. After Nontle brought things under control, she tried to direct Nontle like a naughty girl. I've talked to her like a naughty girl. I noticed among the police, I mean, because I was watching their body language and interacted with quite a few of them, because there was, there was more brass there than I've ever seen. I mean, yeah, there were brigadiers and generals, generals. and you got a sense that they felt almost embarrassed by well, it. Well, the, 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 the briefing um, before the thing was a very professional briefing by this General Swart, who's a very senior policeman, I think, in charge, acting in charge of this whole region. Mm. Very capable, very competent, very sober, very professional, um, empathetic, clear, mm. good understanding of people and the community, mm. the issues, the challenges, the dynamics, thoroughly professional. Mm. Mm. Um, the Deputy Minister, when he came to kind of thanks at the end of thing, couldn't remember his name. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of detached <laughs> person she is. And, she, and, and, and the guy was fantastic. He was solid. I spoke to him a little bit. Um, after the first uproar, I said to him, look, you can't do this. You can't mm. take away these people's lands. There will be blood if you try and force people off this land. And he was agreeing with me. He was saying, they can't do this. It's not on. It's not, it's not going to happen. I was saying to him, it's not going to happen. He was saying, this thing's not going to happen. There will be blood. You cannot take people and forcibly remove them from the land. Not in this community, not in this context. Mm. Um, um, and this was a full ball, a full ball, best go at it. Throwing all the money, all the resources to crack this community. And to get this community to acquiesce, to say, yes, well, let's sit down and talk about how mining will take place in our land. 
and and dishonest. I mean, you know, they were confronted about. I tried to confront them on, 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 on. We know nothing. We don't even know who the shareholders are of 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 this company. There's a community company, Zolka. Mm. Who owns it? We don't know. It's mm. been 13 years into this process. Mm. We still don't know the makeup and identity of the shareholders in the Black Empowerment Company. We don't know the makeup and the identity of an 18% shareholder, this PSG or FSG Securities, this nominees company. We don't know. The only, we know who's got a 53% stake in it. But for the rest, it's a bloody mystery. We don't know who will be moved, where they'll be moved to, how they'll be moved, how they'll be compensated, how their livelihoods are going to be restored. Um, what are they going to do to mitigate the impact on, on, on the, you know, the social and economic linkages between this community? What are they going to do? They're, 13 years on, there is nothing. There's an absolute vacuum, a void. Um, and a total unwillingness on the part of the government to engage in a serious way, to sit down and say, well, what are the problems? I mean, it's clear everything we write, everything we do, all the documents we submit and file in court and do it, they're not being read, not by the decision makers. The decision makers haven't a clue. For them, this is just one more obstreperous little community, probably influenced by undesirable elements from outside. I mean, it is, it is pathetic. It's, it's, it's all I can say. Before we go, I mean, the precipitating f fact of what happened today <coughs> is Bazooka's death. Now, he, initially, I had felt a desperate sense of his absence because in previous occasions, similar to this, he's exercised extraordinary leadership. Um, and you always felt like you could see why they weren't actually, why, they got, why he's no longer there is because he was a good leader and he actually helped mobilize, channel, and prevent things from becoming really violent. The fact that the, all these top brass in the police services were there is at least some progress because we haven't seen that for a while. And you said you had a good inter exchange with the one policeman. And the one I spoke to said, I said to him, you know, why have you guys not put up a reward yet? He said, well, and he gave me a cell number. And he said, well, phone me and I will make sure that something happens here. And my concern is the rule of law is so critical given the fact that the Australian mining companies left we can't use shareholder activism that now is basically, we've won that battle. To say something about how you see the struggle unfolding. Well, I, I, I look, the most important lesson that comes out of this is that you've got a community that has a pretty clear and considered position on the mining and isn't going to be misled by, by politicians coming down making promises and looking grand. I mean, you've got a strong informed community and that's the strength. And, you know, I, I sit there as a kind of an outsider and I watch them and I hear them respond positively to the Mbongis and the cheerleaders and some of the cultural stuff and the dancing and the, uh, you know, Amandlas, everyone responds and kind of wrote and you think, oh, what, you know, people, you know, do they have the strength? Do they have the courage? Um, do they have, do they have belief in their own cause? Mm -hmm. And then you see when the opportunity presents itself for them to stand up and identify themselves, who they are, what they believe and what they say. They stand up like one. Um, mm. So I think, I think really, um, <laughs> you know, what matters most is to sustain that in the community. Mm. Um, unity, confidence. This is a full-on attack by the authorities to try and persuade people to give up their resistance. Mm in the name of unity and political solidarity and you know and appeals to the spirit of Mandela and compromise and you know any kind of shit that is thrown against people um, and they're not falling for it and that's what's important um, but that is uh, you know that is work that is organization and staying in touch with your roots and staying in touch with this community and keeping them informed and educated mm -hmm. um, um, and alive to their rights. Um, you know, we need a strong community. If this community stays the way it is, and if you can sustain this, the mining is not going to happen in this place. Mm. But you know, the question is, is what cost? I mean, for me, I know that you're very modest about this, but you represented Lunga Baleni when he had a challenge to his kingship, chieftainship. Mm. Successfully, you won the case. He, you did so pro bono, 
um, I know you're not going to blow your own vulvazella here, so let me do it. You, you came down here, you, 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 you kind of completely kind of won that case, hands down. The fact that they weren't able to, to subvert him, they then proceeded very effectively to co-opt him. How did you feel sitting there looking at him, sitting there at the stage there? Uh, and the only reason he's there is thanks to you. Ah, mm. uh, look, I don't... Um, perhaps with the exception of politics, I don't sit in moral judgment of people. Um, not ordinary people. Um, the pressure that's brought to bear on ordinary people, including Lunga Baleni, is overwhelming. Uh, the pressure that was brought down on, to bear on this community, the political pressure today that is brought to bear on this, is overwhelming. Mm. Um, that there are people that can resist this, I think, is extraordinary. So, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel at all resentful when when people shift sides. I kind of half expect it, um, and I understand mm. why people aren't people aren't e people aren't equipped. People aren't armed to. Uh, engage in these struggles and to you know and people are it's it's very difficult to in to expect of people that they sacrifice their families their lives you know for a cause that to them looks often fairly hopeless um, I don't I don't uh, he's he's doing what people do um, well, I, I, don't, don't, I, don't, I don't judge him. Well, I, I mean, I find it hard because the two spokesperson from Zolko today that during question time, and you can see it was quite clearly orchestrated, was Zeka Nyamana and Chris Nguele. Fifteen years ago, those two men were my tour guides. They hosted me and they introduced me to this community and absolutely blew me away, together with people like Mzamo and others. It just is, I just find it just too heartbreaking to see that these men who had so much to contribute and because of the fact that they could see they were leaders and had talent were, then the, were targeted and co-opted. How, what, what can be done to somehow bring about that sort of well, culture in our society what, where that's just not, well, I mean that's not well, freedom. What, if, that's you wanna, not freedom. if you want to change that you've got to give people agency, you've got to give them control and power over their own lives, you've got to give them the feeling that they can control their own lives. They mustn't. You know, the reality for most people is they have no agency. They have no control over their lives. I mean, you heard some of the speakers today. Oh, you must come here and you must feed us. It's appealing to the minister. You must come here, you must feed us. We are your children. You must give us roads. You must do this. You must do that. Please, we implore upon you, great leaders, bring these gifts to us. Feed us. Look after us. That's, that's a call from people who are totally mm. disempowered. Okay, That's last, a call from people with no, no agency. Last question, which just connects this story to your basic larger role, <laughs> which of course Minister chose to remind and you of, <clears throat> that you are, you know, you're not just a sort of like a somebody, sometime lawyer. <laughs> you've, got, you've taken on mining issues. Um, the larger issues and struggle, because we've been working 10 years together now, just seeing how the impact and the effect and the sea change that's happening in the mining industry because of you. And how has this particular struggle you know, kind of gelled and synergized with your larger work? Well, um, I think the issues that are being raised in this matter are real import. As a lawyer, they are very interesting questions. Um, I think it's a really, it's, it's, um, I think this is going to determine the rights of communities to determine mm. their fate when it comes to mining. I think this case is going to determine that communities are not subject to the whim of their leaders mm. or the politicians. I think. I think this is the case where we are going to, not now, where we will, as this thing unfolds over the next five or ten years, uh, where we are going to establish unequivocally the right of communities to say no. Um, at minimum, the right of communities to say, we'll do it, but only on these conditions. 
and be able to take that position on an informed basis and stick to it and hold to it. Mm. I think it's about it's a I think there's an opportunity here from a legal perspective to um, level up the playing field mm. and give communities agency, give them control mm. over their destiny. Do they want mining or do they not want mining? Mm. Well it's a simple question really. Are they, the community, going to benefit from mining? Are they, at the end of this process, in the light of all the best information, going to be better off than they would otherwise have been? Well, doubtless, then these communities will say, yes, we want mining, and it will happen. Mm -hmm. If, however, mining means the destruction of their social and economic environment there, their the disruption of their societies, mm. um, if it means what it has meant for so many communities before, people are going to say no. And I think this matter is about the right of people to say, if mining leaves us worse off than when we started, the answer is no. And it's going to give them the right to say that and the power to do that. Mm. And that's what I really think we're going to get out of this. Well, yeah, particularly since if I mean, I've been looking and researching, and I've yet to find, and it's honest research, where in the world has there been an instance of a similar situation such as this, where a rural community have basically moved off the land to make way for a mining operation On a willing that, basis. Have said, that have said thank you and actually been and better, be off. better off for it, and have said, well, fantastic, you know, uh, this is good for us, this has been good for us. But, it's, it, but it's, it doesn't happen. But it seems there's such an obvious self-evident truth that surely that's what the D Department of Minerals needs to come and do. It, say, it, here is a case study of where it's worked and we're going to follow it, that example. It, it appears that our leaders are absolutely indifferent to the question mm. and are deliberately blind mm. to the answers. Okay, but then lastly, I was taking credit for you know, Footsack Matilda is having got rid of the Aussies, but I don't think... <laughs> that's don't a bit of a <laughs> they went, they went. Well done, John. <laughs> what new song do I need to learn? What, what do I have to kind of rehearse? I will put it... Well, I mean... Well, what is interesting is I'm... I mean, here's a thought. What is interesting is I was delighted to hear the Australians were leaving. Um, I don't think it's absolute thing, but, you know, divesting themselves of their shareholdings. Not everyone is delighted, um, and particularly local people, who are concerned that now you've removed the foreigner, this becomes a civil war. Mm. And wars against foreign enemies are one thing. Civil wars are the worst of all wars. And I think what it's done is it's exacerbated people's fear mm. that this is now black against black, South African against South African, mm. one community member against another, one family member against another, and I think people are deeply concerned that this is, this means an intensification of the civil war, mm. and I think, and at first I was kind of puzzled, what kind of response is that to so obvious a victory? But, um, but on reflection, um, I think there is cause for concern. Mm. And what do you think we need to do as these kind of troublesome outsiders? Mm. And I don't just talk about our complexions, the fact that we are connected, we live in Joburg, and, and there are people around the world now who have, thanks tragically to the circumstances... Well, I was just waiting for the opportunity for um, the minister to say, look, I'm not going to give you a hearing because... You know, you're not from this community. I mean, I've been associated with this community for the best part of 10 years, nearly mm. 10 years. Mm. Uh, which is a hell of a lot longer than the minister has. <laughs> and he's from the Northern Cape. Mm. So, um, you know, I have every right to be involved. And, 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 and like you, I work for this community. Mm. I'm not here on my own volition. I'm here to provide a service uh, which I'm mm. called upon to provide. Um, mm. I'm here because mm. I've been asked to come here and asked to make a contribution. And the contribution mm. I want to make is to level up the playing fields. Mm. And that's my job and uh, I do it because that's what I do. Mm. Um, mm. But I, I think 
look, people are tired of violence. Eh? Violence is a very powerful weapon here. I mean, if 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 the mining, the pro mining people, the pro the mining companies, quite frankly, and that was my message to him. There are two things. There's the com there's the people who are going to be impacted negatively by mining, and then on the other side, there's the mining company that wants to mine for profit. Those are the parties. It's not one part of the community versus the other. It's the people who are against mining versus the mining company. And that's, those are the protagonists, yeah. Well, crucially, we mustn't betray our people. Eh? Um, and, and that means, you know, don't allow a distance, don't allow a gap to develop between us. I mean, the ACC, which is probably the most dynamic kind of anti-mining component of this alliance, needs to sort of stay deeply rooted in that community you know, and I think the work you do linking up with individuals and linking up with families and people and um, you know on a one-on-one -on -one level is, is fundamental to this we mustn't allow a kind of a gulf to emerge between us that's what one of the reasons I was really really happy to be here today mm. um, particularly on such a large stage and such a big platform and mm. um, the opportunity to kind of connect and Make it clear we're here and we're with you and we're behind you. I think it's fabulous.